Let's have a word of prayer as we begin. Our Heavenly Father, for reasons we don't understand, you have chosen to give us life at this time of Earth's history. The ancients had longed to see this day that we're living in. And you have special purpose for each one of us. I pray that you will give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts that are willing to obey. And please be with us now as we open your word in Jesus' name, amen. Well, this, if we get something up on the screen, this is Love's Last Call, part two, which means there was a part one. And who knows, maybe there will be a part three. We'll find out. But God has a final appeal to give to a lost and dying world. The issue that's soon going to confront all of us is the issue of worship. Worship is mentioned five times in chapter 13 of Revelation, all in regard to three creatures, a dragon, a beast, and a sea beast, that is, and an earth beast. You could call them uh, an unholy trio if, if you want to. But in contrast to that, then, in chapter 14, God has a three-part message that's a, a call to worship the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. And as you read farther into chapter 14, you'll read that there is the second coming of Jesus and the harvest of the world. But just prior to that, what we read is... God's final appeal to this lost and dying world. Something that we looked at last time, it was love's last call, chapter 14 of Revelation, verses 9, 10, and 11. And I saw a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receives the mark of his name. So I have a question. Do you feel the love of God in that message? It's kind of hard, isn't it? How do you come to reconcile this picture of a God of love with this message about the wine of God's wrath and, and the fire and brimstone that, that causes uh, torment. I had suggested the last time I stood here that if we want to understand where God is coming from with this message, we have to uh, look at all three messages as a whole because they really present a total picture of progression from one to the next to the next. And so if you were to just cut out this one and go around and tell the world, it's not going to be received very well, is it? So it's important that we have context of each individual message in, in context of the whole. So what we need to understand in these messages is this is a character of God issue. Character of God issue is something that our pastor, 
mentions a lot, doesn't he? So, uh, last time in part one, we looked at the first angel's message, which is found in verses six and seven. And they read, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. So what we looked at last time in part one are the elements of what constitutes true worship. And we're, we won't go over that right now, but, uh, but this time now, in part two, we're going to look at the second angel's message and look at the elements of what constitutes false worship. And here's that message in verse 8. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now this is the first mention of the name Babylon that you find in the revelation of Jesus. There are five more times in chapters 16 to 18 where the name Babylon is mentioned again. And in these chapters, uh, in these passages, we find descriptors, we find identifying marks that help us know who and what Babylon is. And um, perhaps that's what you're thinking that, that we'll be looking at today. I will say this one thing, that in chapter 17, you will notice that um, the name of Babylon is attributed to an impure woman who is riding a beast of seven heads and ten horns. This is all symbolic language, isn't it? I've not ever seen a beast with seven heads and ten horns, not even after a night of, of pizza. <laughs> um, it's, it's reminiscent of the same beast that we see described in chapter 13 of Revelation. But it's the identifying of these features that is not really the focus of our study today. What I, what I would like for us to come to understand is that this impure woman riding this beast amounts to an illicit union between a false religion and, and an oppressive government, between a church craft and a state craft. And by the time we get to the end of our study, I think this will become a little more apparent to you. The one thing that is true, though, in this message is that God says unequivocally that Babylon is fallen. It is a form of false worship. And God is declaring here it is irretrievably broken and that its doom is certain. So, in point of fact, as we consider chapter 13 and chapter 14 of Revelation, it's the climax not only of the whole book of Revelation, but it's the climax of, of human history. It spells out for us this conflict between Christ and Satan, between good and evil, between true worship and false worship. There is a gulf that exists between these two, and there is no bridge between them. And there is no third option. So we need to choose wisely. 
understanding the nature of false worship, which is the essence of, of Babylon, is what we're going to look at today. And in order to do that, we have to go back to the genesis of it, if you will. And, and that means we'll have to, well, go back to Genesis. And that's, uh, that will be chapter 4 in the book of Genesis. So that book is pretty easy to find. By the time that we come to chapter 4, though, um, what we have already read is that God had fashioned our planet home. He had created our first parents, Adam and Eve. We read in chapter 3 that they, they failed, unbelievably, they failed a, a simple test of loyalty. Just don't eat the fruit. If you do, bad things will happen. But then God's adversary came and very deceptively, very entrancingly told the lie. So our parents had a choice to make. Do we believe God or do we believe the serpent? We know the choice that they made. And let's be clear about one thing. Unbelief is sin. Un it's unbelief that separates us from God. And God is the source of all life. And the only possible outcome of a broken trust relationship with God can, can be the curse of death and the expiration of life itself. God allowed that to happen. But he's, he's not willing to let that happen to you and to me. So we have a choice in the matter. Amen? What we're told is that the uh, first promise found in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 has the embedded message that God himself would take on the, the curse of sin. He would bear it in our place as our substitute. And not only that, he would redeem the failures of, of all mankind. He would bear the curse for us all if we would be willing to believe that and, and accept that blessing. Not only that, when God would step into humanity, he would bring the rebellion and the curse to an end. And this was illustrated to our first parents by the slaying of this, of this innocent lamb, a substitute, a type of an innocent son of God. So it was the innocent in the place of the guilty. And that is, that's been the gospel message from that point on. And the remedy for sin and death is the restoration of love and trust. It's what God has been working in our lives to, to restore. And it's the faith of this promise that had become the basis for our worship. And now this brings us to chapter 4, because we find that... Um, they had family worship there in, in, in Genesis. We don't read it specifically, but I'd like to think that they came to an altar 
that was there at the, at the entrance to Eden, a place that was guarded by a, an angel with a flaming sword. But um, in chapter 4, first thing we find out is that Adam and Eve had two children. Now, of course, they had many more children than that, but, but Cain and Abel are the two that are mentioned by name. And they were both participating in the worship of God. So let, let's pick up this narrative now in, in verse 3 of chapter 4. And it came, and in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought the fruit of the ground an offering to the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect to Abel and his offering, but to Cain, to his offering, he had not respect. Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. Let me read this same passage to you from uh, the New Living Translation. When it came to time for the harvest, Cain presented some of the crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. So, based upon the forms of worship and the offerings that God had instituted later with the children of Israel, what we find in these uh, three verses is that Abel essentially brought a sin offering, an acknowledgement of sin and need of a savior, whereas Cain brought a thank offering. Thank you, God, for your goodness and, uh, and, and for giving me the fruits of my good works. This is significant because you will read in the book of, of Hebrews, in chapter 9 and verse 22, that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. There is no forgiveness so Abel demonstrated an acknowledgement of sin and of the need of a savior and uh, proclaiming, professing faith in a savior to come. In contrast to that, Cain didn't bring that kind of an offering. He didn't acknowledge the need of a savior but he presented to the Lord a bloodless sacrifice and a trust in his own merits. And so Cain was angry, very angry, for two reasons. One, of course, that God rejected his offering, but then he was resentful that Abel brought an offering that acknowledged the need of a savior. It was like an acknowledgement of, of, of his weakness or something. But in point of fact, the declaration of faith in the saving merits of another is the very essence of what justification by faith is. We saw this in part one of this, of this study, that justification by faith is the foundation of the gospel message in the New Testament. It was built by the apostles and it was built upon the solid rock of the Lord Jesus Christ, he himself being the chief cornerstone. This is the foundation upon, the wit, uh, upon which the church is built, the church that stands today. So let's read on. Uh, the Lord tries to reason with Cain in verses 6 and 7. 
The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, shall you not be accepted? And if you do not well, then sin lies at the door, and you shall be his desire, and you shall rule over him. Once again, um, let's look at it from the New Living Translation. He says, why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, watch out. Because sin is crouching at the door. It's eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be its master. So we know what happened. Sin produces uh, defiance. Defiance grows into rage. And rage resulted in the murder of Cain's brother. When God approached Cain about this, he tried to draw a confession out of Cain, something that amounts to an investigative judgment. But the defiant, guilty Cain claimed innocence of what happened. And the result is something that led to his banishment from his home. And reading on in verse 13, Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from uh, your face shall I be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass, everyone that finds me shall slay me. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whosoever slays Cain, vengeance shall be taken upon him sevenfold. The Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. Now one last time from New Living Translation, Cain replied to the Lord, My punishment is too great for me to bear. You have banished me from the land and from your presence. You've made me a homeless wanderer. Whoever finds me will kill me. The Lord replied, No, for I will give a sevenfold punishment to anyone who kills you. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain to warn anyone who might try to kill him. There's two things here that are vitally important to notice in these verses. They teach us something about the very essence of Babylon. And the first one is that there was a defiance of Cain. You don't hear any confession. You don't see any remorse. You don't feel any change of heart. And there is no remission of sin. The only lament for Cain was the consequence of his transgression. His total mindset was self-centered. There's one other detail that we must not love, overlook. The Bible tells us here that, that Yahweh had set a mark upon Cain. Was that a visible mark? No, we don't know. We're, we're not told. But what we do know is that any act of vengeance that was taken upon Cain would result in a consequence seven times more severe for the avenger. So what does that mean? Well, it means that some sort of authority was invested 
in Cain. You don't dare mess with Cain because something seven times worse is going to happen to you. So the thing is, God knew that Cain's descendants would vastly outnumber the descendants of Seth, the sons and daughters of God. And we find just two chapters later in Genesis that uh, bears this out with the flood of Noah's time. So the children of disobedience were the greater number of, compared to the uh, sons and daughters of God. And they would need some sort, some sort of governance some type of order that that they could that they could uh, live and exist. So what this brings out are, are two different types of laws that we that we find. Um, there's God's law. God's law is immutable, unchangeable. It describes all the design protocols for the observable universe that we see. Uh, gravity, light, uh, matter, space, all of these things are governed by God and by his laws. And that includes his moral laws. And his moral law is just simply embodied in a, a, supreme, a supreme love for God and an impartial love for others. If we grasp hold of that, we'll be obedient. In contrast to this, uh, the governments of the children of disobedience operate under a different kind of law. Uh, these you will read if you study out history and archaeology, what you'll find is that the laws of mankind become more extensive and more oppressive as history marches on. It's a, it's a penal legal construction that's involved in these laws. They're, they're rules. If you break this rule, there's going to be a penalty, and you're not going to like the penalty. They're arbitrary and they're changeable. And the laws of men are subject to whoever has the power at the time. So the mark of Cain is indeed the mark of authority. What's curious here is if you look into the original Hebrew of this mark of Cain that you read in Genesis chapter 4, the Hebrew word that is translated mark is a three-letter word, oath, O-T-H. Don't confuse that with oath, O-A-T-H, like an oath of office. No, it doesn't mean that at all. It's just O-T-H. It's a mark. Well, it's the same word that the Lord used in Ezekiel chapter 20 in verse 12. There we read, Moreover, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign, to be an oath, O-T-H, between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. So what we see in this verse is that the Sabbath is a sign, it's an O-T-H, of God's authority. And it's reasonable to consider, isn't it, that Babylon would also have a sign, a mark of its authority? So let's fast forward past the flood now uh, into Genesis chapter 10. And there we have the list of descendants of, of Noah, uh, his sons Ham, Shem, and, and Japheth. 
and of the sons of Ham, one of them listed is Cush. And one of the sons of Cush is this man named Nimrod. And these are the words of Genesis chapter 10, verses 8 and 9. And Cush fathered Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Well, I've been intrigued and, and baffled and perplexed what the Lord's telling us in these verses for a long time. And then I came upon the translation of John Wycliffe, that 14th century reformer, wrote the first English translation of the Bible. And this, is, this is what he wrote. Forsooth, Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be mighty in the earth. And he was a strong hunter or oppressor of men before the Lord. Of him, a proverb went out saying, as Nimrod, a strong hunter before the Lord. Aren't you glad we don't forsooth and begat any more these days? It's, uh, I'm, I'm relieved to know that. <laughs> So, once again, if you go to the original Hebrew in, this, in these verses, when you come across the word mighty, you will find the Hebrew word gibor, G-I-B-B-O-R. I'm trying to sound like I know what I'm talking about, but you know, I, I don't speak the language, okay? I, um, I have a concordance, and, and I look these things up, and, and, and then I hope that you all take it from there. Um, but Gibor uh, de defi is defined as tyrannical or warrior-like. So what we find is that Nimrod was a warlike tyrant. He was an oppressor of men. Uh, we find the first mention of a king establishing a nation in the world. Uh, nothing before the flood, and this is the first one after the flood. Uh, the other thing we find are the hallmarks of his kingdom, which are two. For one, his kingdom was a defiance of God. And then secondly, it was an oppression of men. Nimrod's defiance of God was so great that he set out to build a tower, a tower so tall, so high, that God couldn't bring the waters of another flood to cover it. Never mind that God said he was never going to do that again. Then, um, and then there was the oppression of men. He, he conquered and gathered people in, into one grouping, into one nation. Um, and it was universal. At that time, there was one language there was one religion, there was one government, and there was one economy. And that's the way Nimrod wanted it, not the way God wanted it. Um, and so you would read a little farther on that God helped the people spread over the face of the earth by confusing their languages. They couldn't communicate with each other, so he said, well, all right, we're going to go over here so we can live. 
And what you wind up with are two names. First one is, is Babel, the gate of God, which is what Nimrod wanted that tower to be. And then the second one is the name Babylon. Confusion is the meaning of that name. So as these nations dispersed, they took with them their forms of religion and they took with them stories about a promised Messiah. And you, if you go into study of those things, you'll find those common threads there. It's, but it's from these ancient kingdoms that all the great empires of the world developed. There's Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, that's Neo-Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. They all have the mind of Nimrod, so to speak. They all manifest a defiance of God and an oppression of people. And they also have the mark of Cain, the mark of authority. And so that brings us back to Revelation 14, verse 8. There followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine, the wrath of her fornication. We already noticed that Babylon is the name of an impure woman in chapter 17 that rides a beast. Now here in chapter 14, Babylon is called a great city. So there's two symbolisms here that are well established in scripture. The first one that a woman represents a church, a religious body. And the second one that um, a city, a great city, represents or represents a beast. It's representative of a kingdom or a state. And so based on the truths that we gleaned from scripture here, what we have of end time Babylon is this. It amounts to an illicit union of church and state. It has the mark of Cain's authority. It teaches a false form of worship, a worship that's relying upon a bloodless sacrifice and on the merit of good works. So Babylon is deceptively defiant of God and incorrigibly oppressive of people. In this system, there is no salvation. There is no hope. In contrast, God purposes for us, for you and me, and all who will, that we be obedient by faith, that we be tender of conscience, that we be cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, that we be free from the curse of sin. He longs for a people to love him above all others and to love others above themselves. The ideologies of the first and second angels are indeed diametrically opposed to each other. There's this gulf that has no bridge and there is no third option. The Bible tells us unequivocally that Babylon is falling. It's fallen. 
the repeat of the fall declares to us the certainty of its doom. She is making the nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. She's making the nations of the world intoxicated with her false teachings. She's relying upon a penal legal power of governments to enforce her counterfeit and idolatrous mode of worship. Revelation 16 and verse 19 declares that she is coming in remembrance before God. It tells us that God is going to take from her that cup of the wine of her abominations, and he's going to give in place to her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his indignation. Now, two of these three angels have spelled out for us the clear distinction between true worship and false worship. There's one more angel, one more message to look at, and that is love's last call. So God willing, we'll be able to visit that message in part three, perhaps sometime soon. Let's pray. Father, these are, without doubt, solemn times we're living in. We see what's happening in the movements of nations. We see what's happening in the governments of, of men. We see what's happening in the natural world that is our home. We see and know and feel what's happening in our own bodies. This whole part of your creation is wearing out. We don't have much time left. I pray for your spirit to be poured out upon your children all over this globe. Help us to see you as you truly are Help us proclaim to the world the, your character of love, of your unwillingness to let us perish, and of your bearing the curse on our behalf. Help us take seriously the days ahead and what you would have us do. In Jesus' name, amen.